Fantastic. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. And I am so glad that you all uh, have taken time today to join us um, and to have a conversation really about direct and ethical communication. And I am aware of how funny it is in some ways to have any conversation about communication on a webinar platform. And at the same time, I am hoping that we can make use of the um, chat function and other ways to be in sort of dialogue with each other as we move um, forward and move through um, some of what I'm hoping to cover today around direct and ethical communication, especially as a facilitator for uh, organizational resilience and strong services uh, to sexual assault survivors. So, I, Jen, thank you for the introduction. Um, I will say, you know, my work with the Resource Sharing Project has been in a lot of different um, sort of arenas and that my um, most recent work has been around um, the Sexual Assault Demonstration Initiative, uh, as well as direct technical assistance to state and territorial sexual assault coalitions, uh, to SASP administrating agencies um, in the states and territories, and work with rural co uh, uh, grantees through OVW on enhancing sexual assault services in dual and multi-service settings. And one of the things that um, really became very clear in, in all of the arenas that I work within, but certainly within the Sexual Assault Demonstration Initiative, was the way in which direct and ethical communication plays a really specific uh, role in uh, creating strong organizations and in creating strong services for sexual assault survivors. Um, for those of you uh, who are familiar with the demonstration initiative, it was an opportunity for us to work with um, six uh, sites across the country around uh, enhancing sexual assault services within dual and multi-service settings. And we recently completed a rather um, in-depth and lengthy report on the work that we have done um, really over the course of the last nine years um, under the initiative. And part of what we learned um, during the Sexual Assault Demonstration Initiative and again in all of the different forms of technical assistance and training that I, that I have been providing over the years is that there is a, a critical element of leadership um, and when I say leadership, I want to be clear that I am not just talking about um, sort of structural power leadership or hierarchical leadership, but in fact that I'm talking about leadership from its broadest sense, as in those of us who do this work and therefore are able to be leaders within the movement, both formal and informal, that there is a way in which leadership um, that we see as incredibly stable, incredibly empowering, and really conducive to supporting trauma-informed and anti-oppressive sexual assault services has a direct correlation to the ways that that leader, whoever they are, um, communicate and to the expectation that the leader and or, uh, uh, well, leader in any sense of the word, but especially when we're talking about um, this, the, the leader um, of any given organization creates an expectation within the organization of direct and ethical communication within the staff and all of the um, communications that um, staff have, whether that's internal, whether it is with um, systems and stakeholders, whether it's with survivors. So I wanted to um, just really sort of pull out the way in which, um, you know, direct and ethical communication is a, an incredibly strong uh, skill for strong leadership in whatever way, again, informal or formal, within organizations. So I thought that today we could spend some time really beginning um, uh, sort of this conversation and unpacking what it is that direct and ethical communication means, 
Uh, I thought we could also identify some frameworks that help us to implement um, direct and ethical communication within our organizations and also within our culture. Uh, and then I wanted us to have some time to start talking about creating organizational agreements um, around uh, communication because one of the things that I have seen in strong, healthy, vibrant, sustainable organizations is that there is a communicated expectation about how folks talk with each other, uh, about how they surface tensions and how they address those tensions. And so I wanted to make sure that we had some time today to talk a little bit about those sorts of um, organizational agreements around communication that we might want to be thinking about. Uh, please feel free, again, uh, to throw any questions that you have into the chat. And as we move forward together, I, either myself or Jen will make sure that those questions get answered. I'm going to also ask you in a little bit to use the chat to give me um, some of your thoughts uh, about direct and ethical communication um, barriers and direct and ethical communication promoters. But for the moment, I want to just say that the work that we do as uh, anti-sexual assault um, sort of advocates, preventionistas, uh, interrupters, um, is work that requires us to be aware of the ways in which we are trying to shift an entire culture. Right? Our work to end sexual violence and to respond to the needs of survivors um, and to work towards healing for survivors requires us to be able to envision a different kind of culture and a different kind of paradigm in which violence is absolutely not acceptable and not tolerated, in which racism and sexism and homophobia and, uh, and uh, so many other issues are addressed honestly and openly and where we begin to identify different ways of being in relationship with each other that prioritize peace and justice, truth and kindness. And so for me, how we do this work is just as important as the work that we are doing. And it is because of that that this sort of communication or, or conversation about direct and ethical communication really took hold for me several years ago now, and where I started reading anything I could get my hands on about how to communicate with people in a way um, that owned my own stuff, asked them to own their stuff, and that was about a, a, a paradigm really shift of communication um, from how we might typically be asked to move through the world. So I don't know about you all, I wish that this had happened, but I did not grow up in a family that taught me, hey, here's what direct and ethical communication looks like. Many of us grow up in families of origin and in cultures and in communities and in institutions in which there's actually reward for um, communicating in ways that can be harmful, um, ways that are passive aggressive, but ways that are indirect, um, and where that sort of uh, bravery to speak both truth and kindness um, to each other in, at the same time in the same thought um, is often not a priority. And so as I began to do this work, I started seeking out definitions. What does it mean, really, when we say direct and ethical communication? Um, some folks use the term nonviolent communication, um, which is another sort of actually um, subset of direct and ethical communication. But when I started looking it up, the National Communication Association had a definition that resonated somewhat um, for me around enhancing human worth um, by fostering truthfulness and fairness, responsibility, personal integrity, and respect for self and other. And as I thought about that, it resonated because the way I had always thought about it was it being in right relationship. Um, in one way or another, uh, both with ourselves and in all of the ways that we try to interact professionally and personally. And so direct and ethical communication and that ability to bring um, that sort of fostering of human worth and dignity in you know, into every kind of communication that we have was something that I started to pay attention to. And as I paid attention to it, I realized that in many organizations, 
and for many individuals, there were a couple of things that really needed to be addressed. Um, and the two main areas that I, I think make a lot of sense it, in, professionally when we're talking about our organizational cultures and the work that we're doing to end violence uh, are agreements that we create ahead of time First of all, the sort of ways in which we set up a, an expectation and a, a culture of direct and ethical communication, and then the conversation itself and how we do that, right? What happens when you need to put into practice that sort of commitment to direct, to direct and ethical communication? How do we do that? So those were the two sort of main areas that um, I determined we need to really sort of pay attention to. So I want to ask you all a couple of things. As we think about direct and ethical communication, I can think of a bunch of reasons why I feel like it's really important for our field, for us as advocates and preventionistas, um, for us as organizations, and for us as individuals who are doing this work to be able to practice uh, and understand and, and use direct and ethical communication in the ways that we do our work. Some of those I want to throw out to you all, but I'm curious about the reasons you all think that direct and ethical communication, and I love that you know, enough of you thought that it was important to join, uh, important enough to join today and have the chance to spend some time um, thinking with me and each other about direct and ethical communication. So if you could use the chat box just for a second, and I'm going to give you a minute, um, and just help us figure out um, collectively as a group, what are some of the reasons that direct and ethical communication is important, is valuable? What are some of the uses? I love it. So I'm seeing folks um, responding. Figuring out the difference between a hard conversation and feeling unsafe. I love that. Absolutely. Maintaining healthy relationships um, with colleagues. Uh, conflict resolution. And right after that, consensus building. Absolutely. And those two things in many ways go hand in hand. Uh, a valuable, um, that it's valuable to set clear expectations, especially when we're talking about a supervisory role or a management role or a structural power kind of role, uh, to avoid misunderstandings, uh, to reaffirm humanity, um, and the, especially uh, uh, to um, reaffirm the humanity, oh, I love this, of coworkers and, and the folks that we work with, right? Um, building trust and confidence, uh, setting uh, he healthy boundaries, transparency, um, improving practice and decreasing liability. Oh, I love that one because honestly one of the things that folks uh, often don't think about are the ways in which instituting um, uh, practices of direct and ethical communication actually does oftentimes decrease our liability and, and we'll talk about you know, a little bit about some of why that's true. Uh, to keep from getting sidelined by unneeded drama, absolutely. Um, and the next answer, in some ways, responds to that by confronting in a loving and gentle manner. Uh, the ways that I think that, um, you know, direct and ethical communication is in, an important structure and is an important practice and skill to have um, are huge, really. There are so many of them, and you all have certainly touched on a number of them. One of the things that somebody said was it helps people who haven't had much voice develop an effective way to communicate um, and ensures that the vision is communicated and consistent, helps negate power dynamics and fosters collaboration, uh, feels authentic, right? Um, uh, all of those things, I have to say, you all are exactly spot on in terms of how we do this work, how we change cultures, and how we make sure that the way internally we're doing the work is just as ethical and intentional as how we work with survivors. So I, um, I see somebody asking, you're not able to see other folks' answers. Is there a place on the screen where that's accessible? And I will just say my understanding is that that is not how this specific platform works, which is why I am 
probably way too quickly, I just realized, reading out a lot of these answers um, that folks have put in. Um, and I will slow down uh, in doing that and make sure that folks have the opportunity um, uh, uh, to really hear each of those things that their colleagues have shared. So one of the things that I want to say is that when I started thinking about this at a macro level, some of the things that I recognized um, were that direct and ethical communication it is one of the, I think you heard me call it a, a supporting structure or a facilitating structure for organizational resilience. And so much of the work um, that I've been doing as a technical assistance provider and as an advocate over the course of the last 20 some years um, has been uh, really uh, lately in recognizing that there are ways in which our work is such difficult work and our organizations are often dealing with organizational trauma um, and we are often dealing with individual trauma. And that when we think about um, and the issue of organizational trauma, um, we know that there are certain facilitating structures that can build resilience, that can help us move through that organizational trauma, and that can help almost inoculate us, um, vaccinate us um, from an uh, ongoing um, uh, organizational trauma and its effects. And that sort of direct ethical Communication is one of them because what we see in organizations that are struggling is we see folks who uh, are not talking directly to each other about the problem or about the situation or about the trauma, um, but are perhaps uh, uh, speaking of things in a way um, that hides the trauma or that um, allows that sort of organizational amnesia of it to take over. Um, and when we think about you know, sort of not only organizational trauma and organizational resilience, but also just strong, sustainable organizations, stable and empowering leadership relies on direct and ethical communication. And systems advocacy, I think about this one often. Um, so one of the uh, things that I remember from my work, um, my direct service work, were the number of times I had to have incredibly hard conversations within um, sort of systems that were working with survivors that I was also working with. And the ways in which, you know, I was not perhaps fully equipped at that time um, to be able to both stand in my own agency um, and power and to honor the agency and power of the other person and to have a sort of direct and ethical communication about the ways in which we each do our work and come to a place of being able to think about what that means for how we work with survivors. I also want to acknowledge that our work is dependent on our ability to address oppression and racism, and that when we're talking about facilitating structures or skills to be able to do that organizationally and culturally as well as personally, that direct and ethical communication is absolutely um, one of the, the practices that we have to have um, in order to be able to do that. Somebody, I don't remember who it was, um, recently said to me, how in the world do I talk to someone um, about their um, sort of inadvertent and yet harmful racism if I can't uh, even like muster within myself the ability to tell them that they take up too much space in the office refrigerator, right? And that to me is one of those sort of key pieces. This concept of direct and ethical communication as a practice is something that supports so much of the work that we do. So it is absolutely everybody's job uh, to really commit to and then to find ways to institutionalize direct and ethical communication within our organizations. And I can't tell you enough the ways in which having the ability to communicate directly about hard things 
inoculates organizations from ongoing trauma. Um, when we are able to surface tensions, when we are able to identify and acknowledge places of difference and disagreement, um, and to do that in a kind and loving and honest way, and where we're able to enter into communications with each other that acknowledge um, you know, the, the need for that, those are the kinds of cultural norms and organizational norms that we have to have to be able to really effectively do our work. So when I think about and talk about it being everyone's job, one of the, the things that I love um, is that I recently was working with an organization who shared with me some of their questions, um, their interview questions. And a part of their interview process was not only to ask the applicant very specifically about their commitment to direct and ethical communication, but to ask them to give an example of a time recently that the applicant had used direct and ethical communication. And what a brilliant way of really um, immediately saying to folks who are seeking employment in your agency or who are going to join your agency and be a part of your team, what a fantastic way to say this is a skill and a practice and a commitment that our organization values and that we expect um, from each other, right? And so using absolutely the um, – every structure that you can um, to start to build some of that expectation internally and institutionalize um, the expectation is a really valuable one. Um, interviewing is a great place to start, like from the very outset. So let's think about together some promoters of direct and ethical communication. I'd love for you all to use the chat box again and tell me for yourselves, what are some of the conditions, uh, expectations, structures, what are things in general that, prom that you think are uh, promoters of direct and ethical communication? Awesome, I see answers rolling in. And a lot of them are, are, are um, reflective. Safety, I'm hearing from a lot of folks, a sense of safety and ability, right, to, um, to engage in that kind of active listening. Um, I'm seeing trust, uh, uh, cultural understanding, uh, a workplace expectation, a modeling by organizational leaders. I love that. Uh, absolutely, when we see things institutionalized and modeled, we are more likely to believe that we are also safe, right, to, to have those kinds of com communications. Somebody said leaving out egos. Uh, a recognition of implicit biases, absolutely. And, and right after that from someone else, humility. Um, so you all are hitting on so many of the ways that, or of the, the pieces that I've heard from folks um, that are real promoters, right, of direct and ethical communication. And I wanna go back and talk about a few of those. Um, and we're gonna do a lot more talking about sort of um, the ways in which there are some really good starting places um, uh, about doing this work. And one of the things that I just want to acknowledge in all of this is I, I saw a lot of people talk about trust and mutual respect and safety. And I think that all of those are absolutely um, uh, important uh, ways, right, to promote direct and ethical communication. They, they essentially set the stage, if you will, um, trust, mutual respect, and safety. And at the same time, I feel like we all need to make sure that within our organizations, we're having conversations about what those mean to us. 
Because when I say trust or safety, uh, what I mean might have one very specific set of expectations and definitions, and what somebody else thinks of trust and safety may be a very different thing. Uh, one of the books that I read in my attempt to um, sort of uh, gather as much information as possible about direct and ethical communication was a book that we um, uh, have tried to share with a lot of our um, constituents and folks that we work with uh, called Crucial Conversations and then a follow-up to that book called Crucial Accountability. And while there is a structure that is promoted within crucial um, conversations and crucial accountability as sort of one way um, of having a hard or a courageous or a crucial conversation, there was also a lot um, in sort of the way that the book described those strategies and those ways of moving forward that helped me to recognize that safety means something different often um, to folks who are in conversation with each other, especially hard conversation. And I know somebody, uh, when we were talking about um, why this is an important thing, mentioned something about being able to tell the difference, really, between a hard conversation and being unsafe. And I want us to just unpack that a little bit and acknowledge that what we're talking about when we're talking about direct and ethical communication often means stepping outside of our comfort zone, actually. So the sense of safety is something that we need to think more about and to define for ourselves and in our organizations. When we say safety, we don't mean, I don't think, um, an unwillingness or an inability to be told things that are hard to hear. Right? Uh, we don't mean uh, not being able to engage in a conversation in which there is some form of personal risk. And when I say form of personal risk, what I mean is the risk of being misunderstood, the risk of um, not uh, feeling completely heard, um, the risk of being authentic and opening ourselves up to someone else in order to better communicate our own understanding of this situation and therefore be better able to hear someone else's perspective on that situation. And so I love the, the sort of ways in which many groups start off with um, talking about trust, mutual respect, and safety. And I, I want to acknowledge um, that there is unpacking to be done for each of those. In terms of safety, you know, when we are thinking about um, emotional safety versus um, uh, other forms of safety, being willing to be uncomfortable is not the same thing as being willing to be unsafe, right? And so helping ourselves and our colleagues and the folks that we work with to think about the definitions that we use. I want to acknowledge that in all of the conversations that we have about um, direct and ethical communication, that there is a really specific uh, um, place that we need to attend to, and that is the acknowledgement of structural power. That when we are in um, a culture in which there is oppression, when we are in organizations in which there is oppression or hierarchy, when we are in relationships, right, where someone holds more power, all, in all of those situations, there has to be an attending to the fact that there is structural power, and at the very least, an acknowledgement right, of the ways in which that structural power could play out in the conversation. And so as we think about that, um, as we think about the sort of that as one of the overarching things that we need to be aware of and attending to, naming it is at the very least part of what we do. I don't think any of us probably work in organizations that don't have some form of hierarchy, right? And one of the questions that I often get is what about, um, you know, situations, what kind of expectation can we have about situations uh, where we're expected to use direct and ethical communication with someone who holds power over 
us in some way, who has more power than we do, and therefore potentially has the ability to use that power. And my, um, I don't have perfect answers um, for how we do, uh, like sort of navigate that in each individual case. What I will say is to start by acknowledging it, naming it. Uh, you know, I, when, when I might approach uh, somebody who has structural power uh, around a, a hard topic, I might start off by saying, you know, I, I'm bringing this to you um, and I am struggling because I recognize that you have a lot more power in this situation than I do and I wanted to just say that. And yet, here is the conversation that I'm hoping that we can have. So certainly naming that can be important and valuable. I, when we talk about structural power and the ways that it exists, speaking truth to power, I mean, the, the phrase itself, right, is a part of our own activist sort of platform and our own activist uh, sort of understanding of the world. And at the same time, um, being able to do that in such a way that acknowledges it and yet doesn't immediately disrupt, right? Meaning, my hope is that in those places where you have power, each of you, where you are the one holding that power, that you're the first one to acknowledge it and to say, I really appreciate your willingness to bring this forward. I recognize that I hold this privilege or this power and that that can certainly affect how we have this conversation. And then you can even check in about what would help create uh, a, a, a bigger sense of safety around this. How could we have that conversation in such a way that it does feel safer. I see a question that somebody came up with and, and I re, or, or sorry, submitted um, that I want to acknowledge is um, really sort of uh, related to what we're talking about. Oftentimes when we say safety, that different um, sense of safety comes up, right? And how do you navigate that? So for example, are you an activist, a survivor activist who is really looking at the issue of emotional safety Whereas perhaps the person that you need to be in communication with is um, a campus administrator who really operates far more from a perspective of job safety or liability safety, right? And so there are ways that even as we approach um, some of this, that we can unpack what safety looks like. Um, and we can say, what, uh, what I'm asking for are these things in order to have this conversation um, in a way that feels uh, like a safer um, sort of approach. Trust, safety, mutual respect, all huge promoters of direct and ethical communication. I want to move on to barriers. What are some of the things that you all have identified in your lives as barriers uh, to direct and ethical communication? What are some of the things that either tell you this is not a, a place where um, direct and ethical communication is welcome or tries, you know, where it just shuts it down, right? Negative tone, absolutely, and defensiveness, uh, fear of being misunderstood, fragility, Absolutely. Um, job insecurity and concerns around that sort of structural power, right? Uh, deflection and defensiveness. All of those things certainly are pieces that really show us, I'm putting up a barrier, right, to that sort of direct and ethical communication that we're talking about. Um, Verbal and nonverbal cues, absolutely. Um, verbal and nonverbal cues are, are both important, and sometimes when we talk about direct and ethical communication, I think we forget uh, that we give instantaneous nonverbal feedback when somebody approaches us, right? And that there are ways in which we can literally soften our stance verbally um, in order to receive. Um, feedback and information uh, in the most sort of, um, in a way that, that shows a, an openness and a willingness uh, to engage in that process. Um, blurred lines between per personal and professional, absolutely. Silence and avoidance uh, until um, the problem really can't be dealt with except with some sort of a explosive reaction. All of these are absolutely barriers uh, to um, being able to have that sort of direct and ethical communication. So when we're thinking about both the barriers and the promoters, 
I want to talk about some of the places that I think it really helps to start um, as we're thinking about having these uh, conversations that are so important and that bring value to the way that we do our work, um, to the organizations that we work within, uh, to the survivors that we work with, and to the overall culture at large. And some of the starting places for me are really around, um, oh, well, and here's just the whole slide. All right, that's how we're going to do it then. <laughs> you all get, just get to see all eight of them as we move through. Um, so starting with goodwill and loving kindness. Now, I want to acknowledge uh, you know, when we talk about trust and when we talk about things like goodwill, um, I want to sort of check in with folks and ask you sort of how you're thinking about that, because I think I often think about it a little differently than some, than some folks do. One of the things that's interesting to me, that assumption of goodwill, I think, is absolutely at base right? Um, in so much of uh, what we need to do in order to have direct and ethical communication. If we assume that the person that we are going to talk to is actually coming from a place that is not of goodwill, that is coming from a place of deceit, or that is coming from a place of manipulation, or that is coming um, from a place of um, sort of unchecked um, uh, uh, oppression. Look, in each of those situations, I want to acknowledge um, we are not typically as human beings as authentic and open, right, um, if we feel that the person that we're approaching does not, in fact, um, uh, have that same sense of goodwill. And yet, sometimes, um, there are things that have happened that tell us that, right? And other times there are ways in which we assume uh, and have negative assumptions about each other, right? And so I want us to think about and talk about that. I know for myself, and I'm, I'm guessing most of you, because this is something that seems to be fairly universal, in the absence of good sort of information or in the absence of information, I often manufacture my own worst case scenario in my head. And when I start to do that, because I am not certain about uh, the facts of the situation or about the goodwill of the person that I am about to be in conversation with, it actually from the outset hinders how I am able to communicate. Right? So what I, I want to say that the starting with goodwill and loving kindness and, and um, sort of figuring out what that means for you is going to be an incredibly important piece of this direct and ethical communication puzzle. I'm able to acknowledge for myself the places where I am making an assumption versus the places where I have had someone demonstrate a lack of goodwill. And those require two very different responses. In the cases where I am making an assumption, right, then I try to check in and, uh, and to move forward with the person um, and ask them for information that helps me to sort of clear up or um, assuage the fear that I have around uh, their goodwill, around their intention, really, um, about having this conversation or the decision that they've made or the information that they've shared. So for myself, starting with goodwill and loving kindness, but also making sure that I'm acknowledging those places where there is a, a negative assumption versus a, a sort of a, um, a factual reality that has shown me that this person does not, in fact, typically, or has not in the past had goodwill. And there's a different way to approach, right, in each of those situations. Um, as we're thinking about good starting places, one of the, the pieces that I find most useful is in all of the conversations that I have um, with folks to try to look for ways to make new ideas work instead of looking for reasons that they don't or they won't or they shouldn't or they can't, right? And one of the things that often 
I see in my um, work with uh, grantees across the country and with organizations doing this work across the country is that in many of them, the past actually ends up getting a veto vote. Um, there is this automatic sort of uh, moving forward of things that have happened in the past that have been difficult that ends up sort of truncating the ability to have real conversation about possibility moving forward and the acknowledgement of that. So certainly recognizing that there are ways in which we can approach conversations looking for a common way forward, um, something that helps things um, move forward rather than uh, articulating all of the reasons that that might not happen, past included, right? I think that one of the pieces that is so important about this as well is the acknowledgement of multiple truths. And when I say the acknowledgement of multiple truths, this is a really very um, concrete place that I think we can start to shift how we interact with people. So back in the probably early to mid 90s, I would say probably mid, maybe more like mid to late 90s, I remember hearing Beth Ritchie talk. I was at a, a, a convening, a meeting, and she was talking about um, the experiences of black women in, who experienced domestic violence and did not then see themselves reflected in so many ways in the domestic violence movement. And as she was talking about it, she talked about the way our culture in general doesn't allow us to hold two simultaneous conflicting thoughts, that it is uncomfortable for our brains, it's difficult for us to hold those two conflicting, really, um, sort of truths and recognize that both of them might be valid. And the example that I often think about with this is the example of um, a white person who is in conversation and hears from a person of color uh, an experience that they have had walking through the world, uh, perhaps being followed in stores or being targeted by security, and who says, well, pff, that's never happened to me. So on one hand, we have this, their lived experience as a white person, and on the other hand, we have their shared experience, uh, shared lived experience of a person who is giving them a contradictory truth to their own. And my, my sort of uh, walk through this world shows me we absolutely ditch the harder thought. We stick with the one that's easier and we ditch the harder one because we struggle so much to hold multiplicity to hold those multiple truths. So what of the very specific ways that we you know, can approach direct and ethical communication with a new uh, um, sort of awareness and a new willingness to engage is by acknowledging that because someone else's truth is not your own, does not mean that you can, should, or honestly are expected to um, ditch that one to keep your own. So how do we live in a world and communicate in a world where we can identify and, and um, acknowledge the fact that there can be multiple truths and that those truths exist simultaneously and that those truths don't make one uh, one thing right and another thing wrong, but that they allow us really a broader picture, a broader view, right, of the, the bigger, more complex issue that we're looking at. So that ability to acknowledge multiple truths and to root ourselves in that multiple truth, I think is you know, inherent to the ability to have direct and ethical communication and to be able to acknowledge other people's realities right alongside our own um, and that there are multiple ways of looking at things. When I think about um, sort of uh, some of what um, I have seen in my work uh, across the country, I have to tell you all, I think that the acknowledgement of multiple truths is one of the ones that is in some ways hardest and also most impactful 
for folks, especially who are taking on um, a real commitment uh, from their organizations to look at issues of racial justice and oppression and privilege. And so being able to acknowledge those multiple truths and to hold both and um, instead of either or uh, is a skill that is concrete uh, and that we can practice on the daily right, it, to help us get better and better uh, at having that kind of direct and ethical communication. Um, speaking positively about each other and about our organizations and about the people that we work with and about um, so many other pieces is a really good starting place to direct and ethical communication as well. And I want to say that when I'm thinking about issues of organizational resilience, having a strong, positive um, uh, um, sort of view and worldview is one of the things that we also know inoculates um, organizations and individuals. And so finding ways to reflect that back to each other within an organization is, I think, an incredibly powerful way of opening up direct and ethical communication. Um, speaking positively, uh, even when we disagree, right? And I want to just pause there for a minute because I feel like so much of what we're talking about when we're talking about direct and ethical communication is really about navigating difference and disagreement. It's about navigating places where we might hold um, views or beliefs or thoughts or perspectives that are in direct opposition to someone else. And about having the skills to be able to talk about that and to work through that and to acknowledge that in such a way that each person feels heard and valued and supported and in which we are also um, acknowledging the difference as an expected, normal, natural part of our work and our lives. Um, so much of the time, uh, part of what I have seen is that conflict is automatically seen as negative. Having disagreement or having uh, uh, um, sort of a, a different perspective is automatically seen as a problem, as negative. And in fact, what I would argue and what a lot of experts have argued is that the more we actually have dissent and disagreement and healthy conflict, the more we actually get better at what we do that's individually and organizationally, that we innovate when there is dissent, that we find new ways forward when we bring multiple concepts and ways of doing our work together to the table. And yet, what I have often seen, especially in places where there's not that sort of commitment to direct and ethical communication, is that conflict is terrifying to people. And I understand this. I want to say, as again, somebody who grew up in a you know, family that did not necessarily prioritize healthy and direct and ethical communication, uh, I saw so many ways in which you know, my family of origin, the culture that I lived in, and the institutions that I was moving within all told me that conflict was negative that conflict was to be avoided. How can we, you all, I'm from the Midwest. We are what we call Iowa nice. And so when I say Iowa nice, it means lots of different things. But one of the things that it means is I will directly see somebody doing something and, uh, and the expectation is that rather than interrupt and address whatever is happening that should not be happening, that I will pause with a slight smile on my face and stare at the person long enough with that smile that they will interrupt themselves. Therefore, avoiding conflict and still having what I want happen happen I, it, it's one, that is one example I've seen play out over and over again of what we consider to be Iowa nice. Iowa nice and so many other states nice um, require us often um, to see conflict as negative. 
And when we begin, I think, as organizations, individuals, and as a movement, um, a movement that's a part of a much bigger movement, right, when we're looking at issues of social justice, that there are opportunities for us to intentionally surface tension and conflict and difficulty and to normalize it, to make it a part, an expected and welcomed part of how we talk about and do our work and that that helps us actually innovate. It helps us do better at what we're doing. In order to do that, this next skill comes in uh, at the top of the list, and that is depersonalizing. I can't tell you how many times I have been in conversations or situations in which I have said to someone, um, uh, what you're doing is actually harmful or hurtful uh, to a survivor, our organization, a colleague, whatever it might be. And, uh, and I'm wondering if you could find a different way you know, to approach this or I need you to stop doing that. And what the person hears is not the thing that you are doing is harmful, but rather you are harmful. Right? Or I, if I say to someone, well, I, I feel like that actually didn't go very well, what they hear is not, this is feedback about the situation, but this is feedback about me as a person. And so depersonalizing and being able to really separate those two things, to acknowledge the fact that who I am, Tat Fribley, is not the same as what I produce in this work is not the same as my, uh, my sort of work, is not the same as my ideas. Who I am is separate from all of that. And being able to acknowledge that separation and depersonalize allows me to be so much more present and open uh, to feedback, uh, whether that is um, feedback that is um, sometimes hurtful or harmful, or sorry, whether that is um, feedback that can sometimes be hurtful initially because it is a truth I would rather not hear, right, but that interrupts something that potentially could be harmful. It allows me to be present and acknowledge who I am is not the same thing as what you are, um, uh, are sort of addressing. So it, it, I love this. Somebody just uh, typed in and said, when someone tells us we have spinach in our teeth, it doesn't mean they're saying our teeth are rotten. And that is exactly it. I, I love there's a, a, a uh, activists who I've heard talk a lot about their um, sort of attempt as a white person at learning racial justice, um, about how if somebody points out that you have a booger hanging out of your nose, you don't immediately get defensive, right, because you're upset and embarrassed. You say, thank you so much, and you turn away and you deal with it, and then you turn back. Um, yeah, you know, there are so many ways in which being able to separate out who we are as people versus the feedback that we are getting professionally gets all mixed up. And when we learn to be able to um, sort of make that distinction, not only for ourselves, but also for the people that we're talking to, uh, we end up communicating in direct and ethical ways that hopefully people are often much more able to hear. Um, somebody just mentioned Jay Smooth. Love Jay Smooth. One of my favorite um, uh, videos, I think, is what you're referencing, which is the one in which uh, Jay Smooth talks about interrupting racism, um, not by accusing someone of being racist, but uh, by asking them or by interrupting and saying that the thing they have just said is racist. Those are two completely different concepts, right? And they are a, a perfect illustration of depersonalization. It's about my actions, not who I am as a person. And the more we're able to sit with that and the more we are able to sort of uh, recognize the truth of that for ourselves and for the people that we're talking to, the more then we're also able, again, to acknowledge it for them. Because sometimes, I'm going to be honest, when we are entering conversations with folks, we may have spent a lot of time thinking about, and as a matter of fact, I will argue we should have spent a lot of time thinking about how we're going to talk about this. Um, and part of what I always try to do is approach it from that place of acknowledging 
I appreciate you as a person, and this thing that you did is something that I need to talk with you about. And those are two really different things, right? I want to pause. Um, well, actually, I want to. Uh, we talked about that demonstrating gratitude for disagreement. Um, uh, I will also say an emphasis on one on one on one conversations. Not to the exclusion of every other form of conversation, certainly. However, I think that if that is our sort of initial approach is to say, hey, I'm really struggling with this person. I need to go and talk to that person. That in almost every situation, that is the best first step. I want to acknowledge that that is not true in cases where there is uh, actual uh, unsafety, violence, bullying, uh, um, oppression that is playing out, that might not always be the first best step, right, where we're talking about actual potential harm. I'm talking about um, situations in which we are in disagreement or we are in conflict or we feel hurt by um, someone's actions, and we want to be able to intervene and to have a different way forward, that in those situations there is incredible value in starting from a place of one-on-one -on -one and not from that sort of, um, uh, you know, water cooler complaining to somebody else about, oh my gosh, can you believe how uh, poorly I'm being treated by this person or I'm just so mad at them or, you know, those kinds of conversations are conversations that typically end up being fairly counterproductive. Um, and to be able to have a commitment, in fact, to having that sort of one-on-one -on -one conversation whenever possible, I think is one of the things that will help uh, each of us practice direct and ethical communication in an ongoing way. And I'm talking about the easy stuff and the hard stuff, you all. Um, you know, when somebody mentioned, like, your stuff has taken up too much space in the office fridge, like, that's actually a great opportunity to practice some of the direct and ethical communication stuff in a conversation that perhaps has a little bit less um, sort of weight, if you will, or uh, potential impact or, uh, or, um, or uh, big picture sort of need for courageous conversation. But when we take those opportunities to, to really directly use these skills and practice it in all of the different avenues of our lives, we're building up a fantastic skill set, right, that helps then be um, uh, really a form of leadership within our organizations and our agencies as we do this work and within our culture at large as we attempt to interrupt violence and violent communication. So even the little stuff ends up having a really direct impact. I'm going to pause for just a minute here, recognizing we uh, have about half an hour left, and I, I'm going to continue moving through a, a, some other thoughts um, for us. But I do want to just pause for a minute and ask you all if you have questions or thoughts, if there are things that you um, uh, want to throw into the conversation for your colleagues. Use that chat box freely, please. So a question I'm going to ask you to use the chat box again for if you don't have any specific questions. One of the things I want to ask you is to think about what are your agreements currently? So sometimes the agreements that we have are um, well thought out and intentional and articulated, and sometimes the agreements are about um, much different sort of, well, this is just how everybody does it, right? Um, so I'm curious to hear, do you feel that you have organizational agreements? Um, what are the agreements that you have in place about how you all communicate? And have those been developed intentionally, or are those sort of an embedded and almost invisible, um, yet really powerful part of your organizational culture? And when somebody says, everyone is doing the best that they can, um, I stress this one a lot. 
So I have to tell you, um, you know, that in all of the reading about um, direct and ethical communication, I also did a lot of reading of Brene Brown. Uh, and part of the reason that I did is because I love her concept of the rumble, right? Um, that this that she has a, a sort of an expectation for herself that when something feels hard, she does some internal investigation um, before she then voices what's going on, that she makes sure she's really clear internally about what's happening. She calls it the internal rumble or the rumble, I think. Um, and as I think about, um, you know, sort of some of this work, so much of um, sort of how we interact with each other is, you know, can go back to that internal rumble. And the what is it that is hard about this? What is it that I need to say? What is the conversation that I need to have? I also often try to balance that rumble with that concept, what if this person was doing the best that they could? What if I had to assume, right, that this person was doing the best that they could in that moment? How would that change my internal rumble? And sometimes it does. Um, being self-reflective um, and, and being willing to sort of uh, give to others the gentleness and latitude and kindness that I hope you're able to give to yourself, you know, asks us to think about how we approach conversations in really different ways. And so for me, part of it is that um, acknowledging that piece. What if, you know, what if this person is doing the best that they can? What does that mean for how we move forward with this conversation? And then what is it about this conversation that is really, what is it that's um, valuable to me? Why do I need it? Why do I want this conversation? What do I need to say? And what do I need to hear? I see other folks who have chimed in about sort of the agreements. Um, one of the things that I think is so interesting, and this one is so common, I'm afraid, the sort of unspoken agreements, right, that are just really embedded almost in the fabric of our organizational cultures. Don't disagree with the leader uh, is a big one, uh, and protect each other rather than maybe, um, you know, sort of being willing to have those hard conversations. I think those are really common organizational, uh, unspoken um, kinds of expectations. Ooh, somebody says they've had ethical communication guidelines in place for years uh, and like to include it in their interviews, their training, and to do role, play, role plays. I love that. Role plays as a practice mechanism is something I think I got comfortable with many, many years ago, right, doing this work. And I have to say I do integrate when I do an all-day sort of in-person training on direct and ethical communication. I also integrate role plays because I agree. I think that having an opportunity to practice is the only way we're ever going to get better at something, you all. And so if this hasn't been an expectation within your organization or within your community or within your family or for yourself, I, I have to say, like, you know, that ability to practice is part of what makes us feel confident, comfortable enough to be able to then address the hard stuff uh, in the ways that we need to. Uh, somebody else says they're deeply envious of the person whose office actually has those written communication policies and role playing. It really is a fantastic um, sort of facilitating structure for resilience. And I am, I am thrilled to hear that, um, that there are organizations out there that are doing that, right? So I want to talk a little bit more about um, something that I've mentioned a few minutes ago. And that is, I feel like often one of the number one struggles that I have personally with direct and ethical communication is in acknowledging the fact that I am not always right. And that might seem super um, sort of straightforward, like of course I'm not always right. And yet, there is a way in which I was taught to approach conversations um, as though I were always right. And that that rightness uh, in a conflict, right, in a place of a deep disagreement, um, that sense of rightness and my need to persuade someone of my rightness can actually create unsafety. 
Because again, when we talk about that big picture sort of safety, what does safety look like and what does it mean? You know, um, within Crucial Conversations, one of the things that they will um, lay out as a part of uh, um, like a, a thought out process for having crucial or courageous or difficult conversations is that you're constantly paying attention to safety. And safety doesn't just mean physical safety or emotional safety in the ways that we think of it, but it also means that if I am trying to convince someone of something, it likely means that I have stopped listening, that I have stopped being able to hear their perspective, and that even within that, they define a sense of unsafety. Because when you are in a conversation with someone who is just absolutely hell-bent on convincing you that they are right, they are righteous, they are absolutely the one with the correct information, there isn't a lot of room, right, for any sort of um, dialogue, for any sort of acknowledging of those multiple truths. So one of the things that resonates so much, I think, in our movement and for me and, um, and for what I have seen in my work across the country is that in any conversation in which you are addressing conflict, so much of the work is really internal. We have to start um, from a place of acknowledging, uh, deeply acknowledging um, that we're responsible for ourselves. Right? That we um, need to acknowledge our purpose in having that conversation, and then we need to be constantly sort of um, checking in with ourselves about the emotional energy that we're putting out, about the space that we're creating for someone else to share their reality, their perspective, their story, their truth. Um, and, and so for me, when I think about direct and ethical communication, it's always interesting as I go out and do this work. I, uh, for me, one of the questions that I get um, most often is, but what if the other person isn't trained in this? And in the beginning, I was sort of stumped, and I was like, oh, gosh, yeah. The more I did this work, the more I came to realize that, in fact, if we're doing it right, that doesn't matter at all. That if we ourselves are doing it in an authentic way that really invites someone else's perspective, someone else's truth, that allows us to say things that need to be said in a kind and loving way using goodwill and to help us move forward in right relationship, that it doesn't matter if you share training it's best if you share a commitment to having that conversation, certainly. Um, but overarchingly, the work that we have to do is work that we really have to do ourselves. Um, the Brene Brown piece that I talked about, that rumble, right? Um, here's the quote uh, from her book, Rising Strong, about that. I like Brene Brown a lot. She is not saying anything new, I don't think, um, that, that people haven't been saying for a very long time about how we do this, but she says it in a really funny way, um, which I'm so appreciative of. Um, Practice, practice, practice. Um, this is how we, um, m how we move through conflict, how we move through struggle is actually as valuable and important, if not more, than the work that we are actually doing. So for me, recognizing that this movement is in fact about changing the world, about changing a paradigm, about changing how we are in relationship with each other overall, it constantly brings me back to um, sort of that willingness to engage with uncomfortability, that willingness to plumb my own sort of um, uh, internal reasoning and places where I get stuck in order to have a more effective conversation, right, um, with someone else and to really be the one that invites that conversation um, to happen in a meaningful way, uh, which I just, I think is, is so much of what we're talking about with direct and ethical communication. So, you know, there are a lot of ways to approach this, you all. Uh, again, I've spent a lot of time thinking through and reading about specific processes. Uh, 
I've spent a lot of time thinking about sort of what needs to be in place to support those processes. I'm not always perfect or even good, to be honest, at making sure that I am integrating all of that, but every day I'm attempting to practice it. And every day I see the ways in which it creates deeper, more meaningful conversations with the people that I work with, deeper and more meaningful conversations about oppression and privilege, deeper and more meaningful conversations about health and wholeness and authenticity. Because when we feel like we are able to bring our whole selves to the table, in any given conversation, and that we're going to be heard and acknowledged, there is a sense of um, sort of ability, a sense of ability to, to then be wholehearted in what we're doing and in this advocacy work that we're doing um, that otherwise maybe can't exist. And that that is part of the really difficult to define um, um, sort of uh, organizational culture that helps create resilience and strength and uh, and healthy um, staff and sustaining and sustainable staff who are going out to work with survivors. Um, and I just want to acknowledge that all of this, the, the whole conversation really about direct and ethical communication is an an unlearning for me, and I think for many of us, of old ways of communicating, of um, not saying the hard thing. And one, I, so one of the things that I always think is interesting, I asked not that long ago in a room full of advocates, an entire state um, uh, had invited um, advocacy programs to a, a conversation that I was having with them and facilitating. And one of the things that I asked was how many of you can immediately identify a hard conversation that you know you need to have but that you're not having with a colleague or a coworker in your office. And you all, seriously, every hand in the room went up. Every single person, when they thought about it for a very short period of time, almost every single person, immediately could identify a conversation that they had been avoiding because they knew that it was going to be hard and painful. And as we, you know, sort of talked about direct and ethical communication, it is, you know, it was such an amazing thing um, to have people start to talk about, well, so here are some of the roadblocks, and what do we need to do to remove those roadblocks to be able to acknowledge that the hard conversations are often the most important ones, right, especially organizationally. I see we have a question that has come in that I want to actually answer because it's a perfect sort of next step. What about, um, this person asks, um, suggestions on how to move an organizational culture which is resistant to change? Fantastic question. Uh, organizational culture is made up of so many spoken and unspoken things. Um, and when we think about organizational culture, we often think of it as something apart from ourselves, right? And to some degree, there is a way in which that is true, uh, that the organizational culture is a, sort of a mashup of everybody uh, who works there, everybody who's ever worked there, the documents that are created within the organization, the policies, the procedures, and the day-to-day -day sort of um, interactions that happen, right? Like all of those things play into organizational culture, and then some. But one of the things that is also true is that all of us actually have the ability to intervene in that organizational culture, whether we are in a place of structural power or not. And I, I can tell you that one of the things that is another facilitating structure for resilience is hopeful and energetic leadership. Right? And when I think about hopeful and energetic leadership, I'm not just thinking about the executive director or um, sort of the upper management of an organization. I'm also thinking about the ways that I show up every day in my workspace uh, and the ways in which I put forward sort of the energy that I want to see replicated in the culture. So that's the first way. Like just simply and, and um, uh, 
you know, sort of simply and at the same time not so simply, modeling every single day the way we want to see our culture change, right? Because each of us are a part of that culture. And then there is that bigger piece of um, speaking out loud um, the, the change that you would like to see happen. And I think that when your organization is resistant to change, it's a way, that is an opportunity to have a conversation. Because one of the things that we see with organizational um, sort of uh, um, trauma, one of the things that we see with anti-oppression work that often plays out, um, one of the things that we see um, in organizations that have, you know, toxic leadership or that have become toxic themselves is that there is this unspoken agreement that nobody says anything. And so the more we are able to, to sort of, again, use that direct and ethical communication expectation to name what's happening, even when it is difficult or painful or unpopular, or when folks would much rather that you just sort of get in line with the, organiza the unspoken organizational culture of amnesia, right? Um, but that there are ways in which naming it allows us sometimes to begin the process of acknowledging it and changing it. Um, so that is a really short answer to a really big question uh, because honestly um, making movement in an organizational culture which resists change often that resistance to change is not uh, the the issue itself but sometimes the symptom of the bigger issue underneath and so you know sort of digging into that and figuring out where is the coming where's that coming from where is the resistance to change why is that embedded in our culture and how do we change it um, so acknowledging it naming it having that hard conversation and doing it whenever possible um, with a great amount of love um, being able to like really bring our loving selves to difficult um, and interrupting conversations can make that conversation happen in a very different way, right? I often, you know, it's funny, I often um, uh, joke with my mother, and this is a, a joke indeed and not a joke at the same time, that it is far more important how she says something to me than it is what she actually says. Like she could say almost anything, and if she says it in this loving, kind tone, I am far more likely to be able to hear it. Um, similarly, when we're working with colleagues, when we're working with survivors, when we're working um, with folks that we sometimes need to say hard things to, tell hard truths, unearth tensions or disagreements, um, being able to do that using a real tone of love and kindness and respect really can change how somebody hears it and is able to interact with you and with that concept and that thought. Other questions or things that folks are thinking about. I, I'm recognizing that we are approaching the end of our time together already, you all. I don't even know how that is possible. It goes so quickly. And I wanted to just sort of circle back and ask folks, how is this resonating for you? Or if what I'm saying, does it seem absolutely um, um, sort of divorced from your reality within the work that you're doing? Is it something that you wish you could implement um, but that doesn't exist currently? Uh, are there ways that you are already really practicing a lot of the sorts of facilitators of direct and ethical communication and the facilitators of organizational resilience and strength and strong sustainable service? Is. Um, so I'm curious if folks could just take a minute to type in the chat, how is this resonating for you? Mm, thanks to folks who are already starting to answer. Uh, I see folks saying that they would really love to implement some of this, um, but really want, need more facilitation skills as a manager. Um, so much of honestly, um, uh, of this work can happen at any level of an organization and at the same time when you are in a, in a uh, place of structural power as a leader, as a manager, it, having that sort of ability to um, facilitate those conversations and having the commitment to that sort of ongoing professional development around that I think is such a key component and such a key piece. I love that you are acknowledging like, hey, this is something I need to get more skills around. Um, 
Let's see, other folks who are talking about uh, facilitating a conversation with their own groups about um, agreements, developing their own agreements really intentionally. Uh, folks are saying that it really speaks deeply to their experience or to them, um, feels true and hard. Uh, certainly recognizing that there are many of us are struggling with some of these issues. I, I'm hearing a lot of folks talk about that this highlighted issues that their organization um, has been aware of, but that it's really hard to make change, right? Especially when your organizational culture um, is change resistant, um, which is a part of that bigger piece. Role plays would be helpful, somebody says. I love that. I have some. I'm happy to share them with Jen and the folks at Wixap, and they can see if there's an opportunity or a time to go deeper on this, right, and to start thinking about the very process for engaging in a difficult conversation if you don't feel like you have the skills yet to do that, and then to practice that um, using some role plays that, uh, that I've developed that I think really um, – are directly from and, and reflect um, some of the harder conversations that we have in our movement. Uh, somebody said working on the implementation of this internally um, already, it's challenging, but the material provides more ideas. Um, Folks are talking about it being very applicable and that it's uh, important to have more tools and that many of you are saying you want more tools to have hard conversations, um, especially with supervisors. Um, speaking upwards, right, in a hierarchy can often feel intimidating and scary and at the same time is something that direct and ethical communication requires that we have a commitment around. Um, interesting. Uh, um, a concern that somebody is bringing up that I want to talk for a minute about is um, when uh, the culture is such that they get accused of unethical communication if they try to bring something up, that it's unethical to quote air a grievance or um, criticize the organization. Um, uh, and again, it's interesting because uh, the person who wrote this comment, I have to say you are spot on in that it, she, they said that it really feels like ethical communication gets almost accused of being unethical just because it's uncomfortable. And I think that sometimes we can start the conversation there. Hey, I know this is going to be uncomfortable, but I need to acknowledge that I'm really trying to have an ethical and direct conversation about what I'm seeing, right? Uh, acknowledging that uncomfortability and that we actually have sort of um, responsibility to being able to sit in places of uncomfortability. If we can't do that, I mean, you all as a movement. Our work is to interrupt rape culture and support survivors healing when they have been sexually assaulted, to go and speak truth in organizations and in schools and in institutions of faith and all over the place. That in and of itself requires us to be able to sit in a place of uncomfortability often. So it's a skill that I feel like many of us have developed for that external work, right, of doing awareness and education, but that we struggle to then put into reflective um, sort of process or, or practice um, internally. Uh, so I am so appreciative of um, uh, of everybody's comments. It looks like there's a ton. I, I want to acknowledge somebody says that um, as a, uh, a black participant, it seems that many of the suggestions were centered from a dominant identity perspective. You are absolutely right. Um, my sort of the way that this um, uh, um, was structured is as a way to try to, in, in many ways, interrupt the white fragility around acknowledging and talking about racism. And I should have been far more um, sort of uh, um, concrete about that at the beginning, about the fact that, you know, in those places where I am talking about issues of oppression and privilege and where I'm talking about direct and ethical communication, oftentimes part of the skills that we are, I think, trying to put in place um, uh, are around um, building and interrupting um, that sort of automatic response of defensiveness and fragility. And at the same time, I'm, I'm really appreciative of your comment. And, and as I move forward doing this, want to go back and look at the ways in which I might be able to shift and change that. Um, 
it sounds like other folks are talking about also wanting uh, um, to share agreements which are based on Kit Evans' model, which I'm not aware of. Um, and they suggest that as a place potentially to start for other organizations as well. Uh, other folks are talking about being mindful that safety means something different to everyone um, and that that really helps significantly in the work that they are doing. Um, just having that conversation about unpacking how different safety is for each person and what we mean when we as a group say that we want um, safety and trust. Uh, simply saying that doesn't actually express um, the same thing to each person who is a part of that conversation, right? Jen, we only have a few minutes left, and I um, really just want to thank you all for the opportunity to, to be with you and to talk about this, and I am so appreciative of the ways in which you all um, gave feedback and, and participated, and I look forward to um, sharing other sorts of resources, including those role plays with you, Jen, and the folks at Wixap to use in whatever way would be useful and helpful. And I am always available um, for questions or if folks want to have conversations about any of the feedback that you shared. So thank you all. And Jen, I'm going to turn it back over to you for any wrap up. Great. Thank you so much, Kat. That was such a great webinar. Um, so I just wanted to let folks know, as a, re as a reminder, please fill out the evaluation um, that will pop up on your screen when you exit the webinar. And, um, and let us know if there is anyone else on the webinar with you. Uh, you can email that to me at jen, J-E-N, at wixap.org. And because a couple of folks asked, I just want to let everyone know that a recording of today's webinar um, will be posted on our website under trainings and recorded webinars, and that should be up within two weeks. So if you uh, have any coworkers that you'd like to share this webinar with, uh, you'll be able to do that in a couple weeks. Thank you so much for your participation, everyone. I hope you have a great rest of your day.